Hey friends, Brad and I started Batshit because we needed someone to talk to about our bipolar. So when looking for a sponsor, BetterHelp was the obvious choice. BetterHelp provides access to therapists via text, via Zoom, via email, via phone call, 24 hours, seven days a week. I don't need to tell anyone how broken the American healthcare system is, especially when it comes to mental illness. But the beautiful thing about BetterHelp is that they'll work with you. Go to www.betterhelp.com backslash batshit. You'll get 10% off for the first month and you'll get someone to talk to right now. If you need to talk to someone, do it. Please. We love you. Welcome to Batshit, a frank and funny look at living with mental illness. While we'll touch on several illnesses, Batshit is focused on those along the spectrum of bipolar disorders. I'm your host, Adam. And I'm your other host, Brad. And we're both bipolar. So strap in and let's see how batshit we really are. Spoiler alert. Pretty damn batshit. <laughs> this episode's topic is getting diagnosed, which I think is probably a good introduction. Yeah, definitely. Uh, because not only will you hear all of our crazy, manic, and depressive stories, but uh, <laughs> you'll get to know us a little bit mm. and understand what it's like when you're first diagnosed with bipolar. Yeah, I mean... Brad, you were just recently diagnosed with bipolar. Yeah, just this year. Yeah. And just then, this year. Let me ask you, like, what did that feel like for you? Because I was diagnosed about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And I know that was a really humbling, I'm going to say humbling time for me, right? Because you think you know yourself and you kind of understand your ups and your downs, your ebbs and your flows. And you've kind of rationalized all of these crazy peaks and valleys that you've gone through in your life, right? Right. And then all of a sudden you find out that that's not entirely you, right? Yeah. And that was, um, I had a very difficult time with that at first. Mm. Um, I felt for lack of a better term, just broken. Okay. Um, you know, I had, like you said, you go through all these peaks and valleys throughout your entire life when you're dealing with this. And I had always chalked it up to, oh, I'm creative. I'm a little different. Um, I can be an asshole sometimes. I can be self-absorbed. You bit. know, not, not too much. Yeah. Though. Like a regular amount of asshole. Re regular asshole. <laughs> regular asshole. Um, but, uh, you know, and then on the flip side, I, I could be moody and depressed. And, you know, I had, I had a rough childhood. Who the hell didn't? But, right. you know, I, I would often think like, oh, that's why I get depressed and yada, yada. But one of the things I've always prided myself on with anything, is taking responsibility for myself. Sure. Yeah. You know, like to me, that was, I never had a, you know, a father figure growing up or anything. And that was one of the first things I learned about being a man yep. is you just take responsibility for yourself and what you do. Sure. And so the idea that when I would do these things, I would try to figure out why I was doing them, mm. look inward and figure out a way not to do them anymore. Right. And getting diagnosed bipolar kind of ripped the rug out from under that, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, last year was far and away uh, my worst episodes, both of mania and depression. And it got to the point where I remember saying several times, I don't know why I'm like this. Yeah. I don't want to be like this. How can I fix this? And that finally led me to the point where, where I was like, there's something fundamentally wrong here and I needed to see a professional. Yeah. And when I got that diagnosis, I'd been latching onto all sorts of other things that had happened last year. I was in a car accident, had a mm. concussion and you know, that can, that can lead to similar, um, right. You're like justifying mating. everything, right? right. You're justifying right. every, um, um, a trade to every symptom, you're like, oh, that's because maybe this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. so I was grasping at straws and I mm -hmm. wanted these things to be true that I was grasping at because they would be temporary or fixable. Right, exactly. Yeah, if, it's that yeah. whole idea of, you know, oh, you know what? I ate wrong yesterday. I had nothing but like sugar and pizza and I mm -hmm. drank too much last night and that's why I woke up feeling like absolute garbage and that's why I feel like that for three or four days after that. Right. And I'm like, well, and then you really start thinking about it and you're like, that's not entirely how that works. <laughs> Maybe to a degree, yeah, you eat like shit, you're going to feel like shit. But to stay down in that depth for that long and to have it feel like, you know, you talk with friends who are like, man, I drank too much last night and I got a hangover. So it's like, I'm sluggish today and my brain's not firing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I drank last night and I don't want to get out of bed for four days. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, wait, that's yeah. not how everyone feels? I'm right? fantasizing about what music to play at my funeral. Exactly. 
you know. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my funeral playlist. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Drop that beat. <laughs> yeah. I think, you know, it, it, it's funny because you mentioned that, like, when you're you're younger, you know, it's like how to be a man type of thing, right? Mm-hmm. And finding ways to to justify how you're feeling and and find a way to work through it. Like I remember very specifically as a child, whenever I would wake up and I'd be in a depressive state, right? And I would not want to get out of bed. My my parents' response to that, and this is not on them. This is not me blaming my parents, but their response was like, "Well, you're a machine. Pretend you're a machine." Get up, do whatever, ignore those feelings. They will eventually go away and you will, you'll be fine. And while, you know, there is some truth to the fact that you cannot give in entirely to those depressive states. You can't. You, bipolar is a, is a, is a battle. It's a constant combat against your depression or against your manic eyes that you can't stop fighting. You have to acknowledge them. Yeah. You have to recognize the fact that you may be in a, really depressive state or crazy manic high and that's you got to even out and you got to figure out how to even out and if you just don't acknowledge it and you don't address it right and it becomes a part of your life and you're like well this is just how i am today i'm gonna go read a book for nine hours and not talk to anybody yeah great you've developed a coping mechanism that's not real healthy <laughs> yeah <laughs> like i mean it's better than some coping mechanism yeah but at the end of the day it's a coping mechanism again a tool it's a tool in your toolbox yeah. but Well, you know, you touch on something interesting there, too, with your parents' reaction to it, Mm -hmm. because that's how a bulk of the people I know, and I used to be like this when I was in my 20s, what I call my period of arrogant ignorance. (laughs) If I'm loud and blustery and angry (laughs) with whatever idiot opinion I have, you'll think it's true. I just don't have to – if I don't slow down, if I just keep going like this. (laughs) But but yeah, so I used to think this, too, and it's the idea that these, these mental illnesses are somehow a choice. That right. you're choosing right. to be depressed mm-hmm. and you can choose to get out. You just got to clean up your diet, Adam, right. and exercise and put on some happy music. Yep, exactly. You know? And same thing with mania. It's that you're choosing to do this stuff. Yeah. I would do things while I was manic mm-hmm. that I immediately – I remember there was this one time I was uh, outside finishing a glass of wine. And for no reason whatsoever, I just threw it into the street so oh. that the wine glass would shatter. And the second I did that, like it wasn't even reflecting on it later. Mm-hmm. The second I did that, I go, why the fuck did I just do that? Right. Right. Because the manic brain is just firing on all cylinders. All cylinders. And you have no control. Yeah. Like I don't know if you've ever had those like Tourette style moments where like I'm driving alone in the car for absolutely no reason. I'll just scream fuck or I want to go home or something like that. And yeah. it's this this feeling of like – this is the emotion I'm feeling, and I'm verbalizing it because I don't know what else to do with it. Yeah. yeah. It's – um. so for me, there's this kind of idea that that I latched on to recently that I think, I think kind of sums it up well is when you go manic, it's like someone opened up your head mm-hmm. and they dumped a bowl of minnows in. <laughs> and so I those like minnows that. are just swimming around <laughs> and like no, bouncing no. off the walls and going into each other and there's <laughs> there's 30 of them. Yeah. And those are your thoughts. Yeah, exactly. You know, your brain is cluttered and it's racing a mile a minute. Right. Um, I had a friend of mine uh, who was telling me how great meditation was for him oh, dealing okay. with his mental, mental health. And as he's telling it to me, I remember thinking, that's impossible. Yeah. How do you still your mind? How do you quiet your mind? Because I've never had that. Yeah, no way. And what's funny is that we're both martial artists. Yeah. Both of us have trained, and there is a, a, a part of martial arts which is about hyper-focus. Mm-hmm. It's about tuning everything out, being in touch with who you are, phys- like in touch with your body, and being able to take that and channel it into whatever physical activity you're doing. And that has always been a struggle for me. Because like yeah. you said, to turn that switch off is just – and for the longest time – I thought it was me. Mm-hmm. I thought it was just I wasn't working hard enough. Yeah. I wasn't trying hard enough. I was not able to cope with whatever the situation is. But when I got diagnosed with bipolar and I was given the justification, a lot of the a lot of the moves in my childhood, a lot of the things that I experienced growing up started to make a lot more sense. Like I I think looking back, which which is hard, because you look back and you see these choices that you made and these mistakes that you made and these opinions that you formed and acted upon. And at the same time, you're asking yourself, like, it, was that the bipolar? 
Yeah. Or was that, was that how you, you really think, really feel? You know what I mean? It's like you sit back there and you're like, did I just have a death wish when I started that conversation with that baseball team? Did I? You have to second guess mm-hmm. everything you do. Second guess. Great way to put it. Because you can't always trust your emotions. Yeah. So even when you're not in a bipolar state, I find that, found this really interesting. One of the, the physical aspects of bipolar that they've observed is that the amygdala mm-hmm. in the brain of a bipolar patient is larger than that of the general population. Interesting. So, so the amygdala governs emotional responses and the fight or flight mechanism. Mm. And so in people with bipolar, those things are so heightened. Sure. Even when we're in a normal state, euthymia, they call it. Um, we love harder yeah. than, than normal people. And faster. And faster. Mm. We hate more intensely. Yeah. We get our, our anger burns at a different temperature. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're more willing, I think, to, to die for our friends yeah. than the average Joe. Yeah. There's like that loyalty that's just yeah. kind of like embedded in you. And I will have my wife say like, why are you, why are you helping this person? Why do you continue to go back to this person who's done nothing for you? If in anything, they've actually hindered you. Yeah. And I've been like, well, because I'm their friend. Yeah. And like, she, I love my wife. We've been together a long time now and we just got married. And in that like final courtship, she just came to me. She's like, you need to cut some of these people out of your life. And it's because I love you that you need to do that. Yeah. And that was really hard to do because I had to have conversations with people being like, look, we can't hang out anymore. I, I love you, but you're toxic. And that hurt me to say that hurt me internally to say because i was like i felt like i was failing them yeah yeah right like you feel like you're failing them by giving up on them when in reality anyone else would look at this this relationship and be like uh dude they've never come to your birthday party yeah they have never even seen your house meanwhile you've helped watch their kids you've you know been through yeah. multiple breakups with them Meanwhile, it's like, you're like, dude, why are you even friends with this person? Yeah. Or even if you had someone that, that was there for you mm-hmm. at a time and, and was important to you and you guys meant something to each other and you kind of drift apart or whatever. Yeah, yeah life happens. happens. But they still hold that place for you. Right. I think for everybody else, people who don't have bipolar, they don't hold that same place in their heart. Right. Right. Once that relationship has kind of drifted off. Right. Like you look back at like high school friends. Right. And people always talk about like the good times they had in high school with their high school friends. I would still ride or die for 90% of my high school friends. Yeah. Even though I haven't talked to most of them in 20 years, 30 years. Yeah. And it's like, well, what does that say about me? What does that, does that say? Oh, you're just a really loyal person. Or does yeah. that say you have an unnatural attachment to these relationships and That's you need a- to take a step back? I sometimes feel like I'm a chump. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, I feel like. <laughs> I feel like all I want to do for the people I care about, mm-hmm. you know, that I want to, I want to bend over backwards to help them. I don't want to see yep. any of them in stress. Mm-hmm. I don't want to see any of them hurting. I, you know, if I can help them in some way, I can. And I often feel taken advantage of sure. as a result because, like you said, you don't get that in return. Nope, you, you don't. Know? One of my oldest and best friends uh, has been going through a lot of shit the past couple of years, and I've been there for him constantly. Mm-hmm. And after I got diagnosed, I reached out to him and was like, Hey man, you know, I'm, I'm bipolar. And he like commiserated with me. And I was, I was like, I kind of need to hang out with somebody right now. Right. And he was basically just like, oh, I don't have time. And I haven't heard from him since just ghosted me right. after just that. Just gone. Yeah. yeah. He's in the wind. And it's like all the shit. Like I paid this guy's rent before. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I would say right now in a work situation, like I, uh, so there was a problem at my work, by the way, uh, we both work and live in Hollywood. We're both working the creative end of Hollywood and I'm a finishing producer for uh TV and film. Uh, one of my editors, right. Who is not a guy I've hung out with socially. He's not a guy I've actually, because of the pandemic, I've only met him in person like two or three times, but he was one of my regular editors that I would hire for projects. There was a miscommunication between him and some of my upper management, right? Because we were talking about bringing him on for various things. Yeah. And I was furious, like to the point where I was going to call up and scream at my boss. And I remember being like, whoa, man, this is an editor. I don't even know if he knows your last name. <laughs> like, yeah. like this is a freelancer who knows the business, who understands the ebb and flow of work. There is no reason that his being hired or not being hired for this one project should affect you at all. But my sense of loyalty, my sense of devotion to these people is paramount. It's yeah. just like, nope, it's this. This is how you feel. Yeah. And you have to react and 
act off of that, which is not healthy. It's just not healthy, yeah. right? And it's – at the same time though, you know, there's there's so much good and bad. I don't want to say good that comes with mental illness. It's a mental illness. but well, yeah, but – But that – even though I feel like a chump sometimes and I feel like I get taken advantage of, mm-hmm. I also kind of feel like that's the best part of me. Sure. I, I would know? rather be that than the opposite. Right. Right? Like, right. Than to be just selfish and using other people. Exactly. Like what, um, what is – what does society gain by having another person who does that? Because I'll tell you right now, there's a ton yeah. of people in this world who do that, right? They're just yeah. like, whatever. You know, me first, you never. Yeah. And like what is the benefit of having another person like that? Okay. If I'm the guy who's got to – it, it's like that whole idea of the guy who holds the door while the rest of the platoon gets out the back. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the guy who's like, I'll be the guy who takes the fall. I'm happy to be that guy who takes the fall because I feel like I'm obligated to be that for some reason. I'll be the guy who who stays behind and sacrifices himself. And I'm not doing that because I feel like I want to be a hero. It's because I feel like that is the right thing to do mm-hmm. and that is what you are built to do. It's what you're capable of doing, so you do yeah. it. Right, it's that, that whole idea of, like, we're both good sized guys. Mm-hmm. If we see a wrong happening, we want to rectify it. Yeah. If there's a situation where someone is being mistreated, or in any way, shape, or form, we want to step in. And it's one thing to say someone should step in, and it's another to have this gear turn on in your head and be like, you have to get in there now. Yeah. You have to save that person because that's your job. That is how. You are built, and that's how you're designed to function. Yeah. And it's it's not good because it puts you in a situation, a dangerous situation. It puts you yeah. – like I'm not even like not even thinking about the people you're with. Like what if you're with your wife? Yeah. What if you're with your kids? You know what I mean? And then all of a sudden you see a wrong and you're like, I'm going to step in. And it's like, what? But, whoa, what about all this over here? But now all of a sudden your focus is there. I, one of the main reasons, by the way, guys, we started this podcast is because we both want another form of therapy. We want to yeah. talk this out. And I feel like neither of us have any answers. At least I don't feel like I have any no, answers. No, I don't even know if there are answers. Right. But verbalizing it, vocalizing how we're feeling is is part of it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Help us continue the conversation. Leave us a comment with your thoughts, experiences, or questions about mental health. Every opinion and viewpoint is valid. Just don't be a dick. Right? Yeah. yeah. And and commiserating with someone else who's been there. Right. Because that's one of the tough things for me. Everybody I hurt last year, mm-hmm. when when I went into just these horrible manic and depressive phases, or mixed state phases, sure. which... Those mixed feature stages are by far the worst. Jesus. In a nutshell, that's where you experience the worst of both worlds. Mm-hmm. So you have the mania and the anxiety and the, and the narcissism and everything that comes with being manic. But at the same time, you feel worthless and yeah. unlovable. And all the yeah, shame upon shame upon shame, yeah. right? Oh, the shame and the, the shame guilt. Is worth. Oh, God. Um, you know, and so everyone I hurt last year, I'll have these conversations with them and they're sympathetic. Mm-hmm. They, they understand in a broad context, right. mental illness, but they don't get it. And how know? can you? I mean, how yeah. can you, like, if you've never experienced it, yeah, people, people talk about getting excited about something or being like elated and happy. And I go, the only way I can compare that, I can compare that to is one of my manic highs. That's yeah. what I feel. I feel manic high. And part of me knows that this isn't exactly what other people are feeling yeah and that the manic highs is you're you're in this constant state of euphoria yeah um your brain is flooded oh god you're firing dopamine serotonin oxytocin Mm -hmm. uh the same chemicals you're flooded with when you fall in love with someone Yeah, yeah, yeah um and the best way i can describe mania to anybody is imagine being on coke and molly for a week straight Complete with the crash <laughs> right, yeah. that would come at the end of it. And that's pretty much what it's like. Yeah, I completely agree. And you get all those chemicals flooding your brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, mania often makes people think that they've fallen in love yeah. while they're in a manic state because those same chemicals are just washing your brain mm-hmm. the entire time. But times 10. Yeah. So it's not just that you've fallen in love. It's the most intense, wonderful – destined it's, to be love that, that you could ever experience. You can't get this person out of your head. Yeah, it's 24-7. 24-7, you're just like, I have to be with this person. Yeah. Uh, what do they need? I will give it to them. Do they need rent? Do they need an arm? 
here's my arm. Yeah, I don't yeah. need this arm. I have two arms. Why wouldn't I give you one of my arms? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and and that's that's not just bad for the bipolar person. That's bad for the target. Oh yeah. Of their affliction. Right. Yeah. You know. And, and you it, have relationships that are like that. You have you have friendships that are destroyed because you suddenly because of the mania mm-hmm. think you've fallen in love with this person. Sure. Or, yeah. or you know you come into a relationship at a eleven. Yeah. Right. Like you meet someone and you click and you click with that person and then the next time they see you you're like by the way. Anything you need, I'm gonna give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and this person's like, oh, let's slow the roll. And I'm like, there is no slowing. Yeah. There is no slowing. The roll's already happening. It's just coming down the hill. Here's a collage I made of us. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> I stole your hair in your sleep and I made a doll. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh. It's, it's so frustrating because, and here's the other interesting part of it because we're both creatives, right? Yeah. We will take this mania and we will put it into our creative outlet. And we will produce in overdrive. Oh, man. Right? When I was manic, I would have weeks where I would write a screenplay, three short stories, 60 pages on a novel yep. without sleeping. You know, one of the first questions my psychiatrist asked, I met her on a Tuesday. Mm-hmm. She said, uh, do you find yourself getting overly engrossed when you start a new project? And my response was, well, I started a new novel on Saturday and I'm 140 pages into it. <laughs> so you tell me. <laughs> I mean, is that normal? Is that what other yeah. people do? But that's the other part of it, right? You don't 100% know because it's a creative process. Yeah. How much of this is your creative process and how much of this is the mania? Mm-hmm. How much of this is just you like it, it, not reeling yourself in, not fighting the mania? Right? Yeah. How much of it is just you diving and just letting go? Because you can produce amazing stuff during that mania. The, yeah. the, the stuff that you just pound out, you know, like you write a script in 72 hours and you're like, dude, nailed it. Yeah. And then you go back and you're like, how is it better to have taken two months to do this? Yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I th- a lot of people get misdiagnosed mm-hmm. at first. People who have bipolar, they don't see the mania as a bad thing. Right. Yes. And so they only go to see someone when they're depressed. Right. And everybody's like, oh, you're manic depressive. That's why, I mean, you're just depressive. There's like, yeah. you, you have depression. Here's, uh, Zoloft. Here's, um, I'm trying to think of another one for just depression right now. Uh, lithium. Sure. Lithium. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And they're just like, here, this will fix it. And it's because yeah. you're sitting there going, great. The depressive states are going to be dealt with, and I guess they'll ride this manic high. Well, and the SSRIs that they give you mm-hmm. for depression will trigger manic states. Right. There's so many things that can trigger a manic state. Too oh. much coffee yeah. can trigger a manic state. And I look back on last year, and the things I was doing, just my lifestyle, is it was like I was subconsciously trying to get manic as much as I could. Dude, if I could live in a manic state, I would. Yeah. Like 24 seven. I would live there. It's my, uh, my psychiatrist described it as, um, I constantly had this campfire burning, mm-hmm. but last year I went and got a bunch of oil drums and just kept tossing <laughs> so, them into yeah. it. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Why now yeah. the fire's bigger? Well, and it feels great. It feels amazing. And this is the thing, the dangerous thing about being manic is not only does it feel great, there's a period of mania as your mania ramps up where you're funny. You're charming. Dude. You're the life of the party. People Dude. want to be around you. They find you sexy. They, they, you know, you're flirting like crazy. Yeah, I guarantee. And, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Then it goes too far. Right, 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 right. And then you're just, you know. But I guarantee any relationship I've ever had, it started when I was in a manic place. Oh, oh, completely. Every, like, completely. A, a, normal Adam or depressed Adam, not starting a relationship yeah. with anyone that, and, and that includes friendships. Definitely, friendships. yeah, definitely depressed Brad. <laughs> Depressed, depressed Brad has pushed a few people away. Exactly, right? And, <laughs> and it, it, it's one of those things, like you said, like I would love to live in that manic state all the time. The problem is the crash. The problem is the downs. And, well, you know, we'll talk about medication on another level, another episode, but it's that idea of like the bottom of that pit is too deep. Yeah. And if anyone ever tells you that you should not be on meds, uh, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Exactly. The bottom of the pit has been risen up, right? So now it's not 50 feet deep. Now it's 10 or 15 feet deep. Yeah. It's still a pit. It's still a down, but it's not a, you know, don't talk to me for a week. And the same thing with the mania. Yes. It's not as high. So for me, the mania would, if I, if I could have kept it in that point where I was creative and charming, 
that would have been great. Right. But then it go, blows past that mm-hmm. and you get more and more into the grandiosity. Oh, you dude. become full of yourself. For me, it was like I was the main character of a TV show I was in and no one else mattered. Everybody else that existed around me existed to serve my story. Yep. You know, I, uh, I became a pathological liar. Mm. Um, which I think was due like to the minnows. Yeah, totally. <laughs> There's well, just a thousand thoughts firing in the open your mouth. Like, it's just, look, blah. you're like, I have this to accomplish. What do I need to do to accomplish this right. thing? I'm just right. say this. It's fine. It's not a big deal because it's because the narcissism. Right. Right. You're just like, oh, this will be fine because I'm more important in this. I'd moment. read something to a psychiatrist. So the DSM five um, doesn't actually consider lying a bipolar symptom, mm-hmm. but a lot of psychiatrists do. Really. Yeah, and uh, they think it might come in in the DSM-6 in the next edition. Okay. But uh, a lot of psychiatrists do, and if you go on uh, Reddit or any forums, um, yeah, because Reddit is a great source of information. You know what? I'll tell you right now, all of my life choices are based off of what I read on Reddit. Oh, man. (laughs) PubMed exists, folks. You don't have to go on Reddit and listen to (laughs) Big Gun 69 tell you. How'd you know my screen name, bro? How'd you know? I just guessed you know. (laughs) But, um... Uh, yeah, so, um, the, uh, the lying, I'd read this interesting thing, uh, by a psychiatrist, I believe Carolina Vasquez, okay. that's who it was, but, um, she was saying that a lot of the times in bipolar people, the reason we lie, you've got the creativity, you've got the cluttered thoughts, mm-hmm. all these things, the impulse control, but that we're trying to express deep psychic truths that we don't feel the facts support. So for an instance, okay, yeah. you, um, I would have this a lot when I was in a mixed feature state. Okay. I would feel so worthless and so okay. unlovable that the only way I could get that across to people was to pretend my wife had told me that. Oh. Because that would crush you, right? Right, yeah. If your totally. wife told you something like mm-hmm. that, that would crush mm-hmm. you. And that was the intensity sure. of that feeling for me. So the only way I could convey that to other people was to pretend it was told to me. Oh, yeah. For instance. Right, right because yeah. you're not going to sit there and be like, I feel worthless. Right, yeah. because everyone's well, like, and even if you do, right, like people are going to be like, eh, whatever, yeah. or why, get the and, fuck up, yeah, exactly. But if you sit there and you place blame on another individual, if you're like, well, this is because my wife treated me X, Y, Z, everybody's yeah. like, oh, poor Brad, what's going on with Brad? And yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, you, so you're you're trying to convey these emotions mm-hmm. with a story because your brain your brain's racing a mile a minute. Yep, you've yep. got the manic creativity firing. You've got uh, the the cluttered brain. Yep. You've got the grandiosity oh. where it's like morality kind of ceases to exist Mm -hmm. also the impulse control you know and when you blow past that in mania too you've got the the risk taking um you know a lot of a lot of uh people indulge in drugs alcohol risky sex sex, gambling Mm -hmm. um overspending oh dude i find uh i find that a really interesting trait and it hit me hard i mean you would not believe i'm so embarrassed by the amount of money i blew last year i will never say yeah um, and then you ne- never have to. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I find that a really interesting trait that sure. just the idea, I don't know how it was for you, but for me, it was like there were, there were no repercussions for my actions. Mm-hmm. And that included money that there would not be, you'd never get to a bottom. It right. was like money was an infinite resource. Yeah, exactly. Because the idea of repercussions was so foreign to me when I was in a manic state. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally get what you mean because it's that whole idea of like, this is giving me a satisfaction yeah. at this moment. Me spending this money in this way is giving me satisfaction, and I deserve this because yeah. this is what I deserve. And yeah, entitlement. You're enti- there it is. That's yeah. the word. Thank you, yeah. the entitlement. Like yeah. you're entitled to feel this way. So how could this resource ever run out if you're entitled to feel this way? Yeah, I am owed this. I'm owed this. Because I'm an amazing person. Yep. And I've gone through some horrible shit. Well, and so the world has to pay me back. Well, that's the fucked up part of it, right? Because you can sit there and be like, I was in these depressed states, so I've earned this manic state. Right? Yeah. I've suffered through these like weeks that I don't want to get out of bed. So I deserve to feel yeah. like a million dollars. I'm going to spend a million dollars because I deserve this. I've earned this. And if yeah. the world is right, which by the way, the world is not right, it will. <laughs> I, what? I, I know. I know. Okay. That, you heard it here first, everybody. <laughs> the, the world is not perfect. Um, then there's no way that I will ever be knocked off of this pedestal. Yeah. And, and you get frustrated that other people can't see that about you. Right. right. It's like, why don't you see how wonderful I am? Or, or I deserve this. How yeah. can you not understand that I yeah. deserve this? Yeah. Like, didn't you see when I was alone in my bedroom for two weeks? They're like, 
no, we didn't. We weren't there. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, don't you watch my webcam? No, it's, but it's, ah. Uh. And it's funny because, um, so on the surface to someone seeing it from the outside, when you're in those periods of grandiosity mm-hmm. during mania, it can look like clinical narcissism. Oh, totally. But the motivations are different. Mm-hmm. So the clinical narcissist is specifically trying to manipulate people. Yes. The manipulation is like a side effect of what's going on in the bipolar brain. Mm-hmm. We're not specifically trying to manipulate people. We're just trying to get them to understand. Yeah, it. Just, just, yeah. Why can't you see my point of view? Exactly. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's understanding that the, um, uh, understand me. That's all I want. I just want yeah. you to be on my level and they can't be. Yeah. And they can't be. So people listen. This is what this is going to be. This is what this podcast is going to be. It's just going to be a discussion about how it feels to be bipolar and how we are dealing with it. And I know there are a lot of people out there who are not diagnosed. I know there are a lot of people out there who may be diagnosed and they feel like they have no one to talk to. So take what we're saying here and let it affect you. Let it hopefully make you feel like you're not alone. Yeah. Right. Because you're not like there are people out there who feel the same way you do. And though we may not show the the mania and the depression the same way, we're going through it, too. So please know that you are seen. We care about you and that if you have questions or answers, if you have answers, if you could do me a favor and call me, like if you have answers to any of this, please call me. I'd appreciate it. And if you're not on medication and we'll cover this in our next episode. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of stigma and misinformation about the medication that goes along with being bipolar, but trust us, it's what it will allow you to control it. Exactly. And how can you have a functional lifestyle without being in control? Yeah. yeah. And that's what the medication does for me. It takes off the highest highs, the lowest lows, yep. but it lets me also realize when a, an episode's coming on. Cause mm-hmm. I've had a few times this year where I started to feel manic or started to feel depressed, but I was able to recognize it. And because of the medication, get myself out of that episode. Yep, exactly. So Brad, I want to say thank you for having this manic idea of doing a podcast. <laughs> it probably was a manic <laughs> idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> guys, we're going to talk about a lot of different stuff. Girls are going to talk about a lot of different stuff. And I hope as two guys going through this, that you feel some solace and you feel seen. So uh, stay tuned for the next one. We got a lot to talk about. <laughs>